My name's John Boschewa. I work for a company called LifeX. Like many businesses, LifeX started as an idea. Phil Bosch was talking to a friend of his about whether it's possible to make Wi-Fi enabled light bulbs, so control light from your phone. Then Phil spoke to his dad who has done a lot of engineering, a lot of prototyping over the years. It came about from my son. He came up to me one day and said, oh, I've got a great idea, Dad. I really want to make a light bulb that you can switch on and off from your phone. And he said, do you think that's possible? The LifeX story actually unfolded at the hackerspace uh, here in Melbourne. I went to uh, my my local hackerspace which I'm a member of and spoke to my good friend Andy and uh, he said yes it's very doable that's how it all kind of started me Andy and my son Phil uh, became the founders of LifeX. I met John through his uh, through the hackerspace the three of us uh, did some initial prototypes. We built the first lot of prototypes and we tried them out and they worked perfectly. We used Zigbee in the beginning just uh, because that's what we knew we, we had no idea what the future was to bring to us we wanted to make the best quality product we could possibly make. So my role in LifeX is really very much the beginning. Sort of uh, one of the things I do is just prototyping. I'm usually looking ahead to what's just becoming commercially possible and been playing around with microcontrollers with networking on them, LEDs. And at that point, there was a bit of a confluence of so Kickstarter for funding, LEDs that had a good price performance, so the lumens per watt, and mobile phone apps, and all those things meant that a product that previously couldn't be made could be made. And uh, and I was just prototyping all those things. A few guys got together to prototype what Wi-Fi lighting and coloured LEDs lighting might look like and made a sample which then John Boscher took to his garage to refine it a bit further. We found very early in the piece that Zigbee was a completely unusable platform to run lighting on. It's too slow. Like I physically remember standing in John's garage looking at you know the first LifeX prototype sitting on the desk in a desk lamp with a little RGB LED head you know driven by in fact Arduino based boards at the time. Then my son said all right I'm going to put this up on Kickstarter let's see what happens. A Phil put together a video, a couple other fellows got involved. In the beginning, Mark came to us because he had experience in manufacturing products before. He would manufactured uh, engine management systems for cars, you know, the ECU units and that sort of stuff. He was the designer of the first Wi-Fi module that we had. Put a huge amount of work and development into that. I came on board uh, not long before the Kickstarter video. I was aware of the project and the development and the team. In fact, Andy shared with me the very latest cut of the video not long before the Kickstarter launch. And uh, we looked at it and I, at least my, for myself personally, I realised it was going to be a, a very big, serious thing. We we were only expecting a, a very small response from Kickstarter, you know, we, we weren't even sure we, we would get any response. I've seen how beautifully powerful it is to attach something that people are using like every day in their life, in this case the addictive iPhone or Android phone at the time, and put something up next to it that was relevant and that worked in their life. And for us, we actually put up you know, the iPhone and Android phone and a light that does something that you know, no other light has done before. And then in uh, September 2012, the uh, the go button was hit on the Kickstarter campaign. The other guys were like, "Oh, if we get to 100 grand, it might be, you know, it might just be worth it. Or if it gets to 400, it'll, you know, everyone will get paid a bit and it'll be good." And I'm like. It's going to go nuts. Whilst we had had quite modest expectations of maybe raising $100,000 over a couple of months, internet lightning struck and uh, $1.3 million was raised in five days. But after Kickstarter taking off like it did, quite frankly, we were all scared. It was the right time for the market and I was familiar with what the iPhone and smartphone accessory market was like and that you know, attaching these stories together, you know, the internet, the confluence of the internet, smartphones and devices that were internet connected essentially, you know, smart home devices was going to be amazing and fortunately that proved out. The Kickstarter campaign launched and it went crazy. It, it took off so well, yeah. It was uh, quite a surreal experience watching the funds uh, pour in. Uh, just over the first 12 hours uh, uh, and as we hit our goal. Yeah, Kickstarter for us really was the, the go switch. The Kickstarter campaign was absolutely everything. It was the market validation and what uh, investors and VCs call that traction moment, which is the literal proving moment of the possible success of that product and idea in the future. Kickstarter is a great place to find out if your product will be popular. It became apparent that we had to deliver uh, maybe 10 times what we'd originally had expected. Because this meant we actually had to manufacture a lot of this product. So for us it was the confluence of smartphones, the huge adoption of smartphones, the internet, the ability to market and present yourself to everyone in the world on Kickstarter and put all of that together and uh, present 
this idea and product in a way that people could back it. This fairy tale beginning, I don't think happens to everybody. I think we were very fortunate we had the right product at the right time going to market when the market actually wanted this product, you know, and not that any of us were aware of marketing <laughs> in any way or form, but... Uh, normally, uh, Kickstarter uh, is not meant to really start companies or employ people. It's really about uh, delivering on your, your promise. It might be an, an artistic vision or, an, or, in this case, a uh, some sort of product you'd like to deliver. But it's really meant to be the pledges are meant to cover the, the rewards that people are expecting. It's not meant to pay salary. So that, that funding doesn't come through for a couple of weeks until after you know, the uh, campaign is closed. So we're very fortunate that uh, some other investors uh, were willing to uh, help us uh, uh, be successful. There was some very early like angel seed stage funding from investors, two of them from here in Melbourne they are still with the company, they're brilliant. And the campaign was uh, brought short bec before things got completely out of hand. When we decided to pause the Kickstarter campaign six days in, even with that huge success that it had run, but being able to do that was the fact that we had internal investors that could give us additional funding to hit that go-to-market stage rather than let the campaign run its course. In fact, there was a big strategic decision about do we want 10,000 potentially screaming customers asking us for a product we're yet to fully design across the next year or 100,000 screaming customers. We may have ended up with 100,000 and actually failed under the weight of the communication and social feedback that we'd need to work with across a year you know, for 100,000 people. So right from the start we had uh, enough money to be able to pay our way, have an office, be able to afford flights and everything else you need to to get underway to China. To get this product started from the crowdfunding campaign and its success and get it to the point where we could develop it and ship it was an incredible path. So with the investment, you know, instant company forming, we had a good mix of people in terms of uh, so people from more entrepreneurial, people who do logistics and marketing, uh, some en engineers, some people brought on to do uh, firmware development. From that forming stage and the engineering and development actually went from myself and Andy to hiring uh, two additional firmware engineers uh, the year after the crowdfunding campaign to start to build the firmware and look at the cloud infrastructure and then the apps and build what was going to be the whole product itself. Also the the harder task of going to China to design for manufacturing and get the electronics underway and uh, off we went. We didn't have a manufacturer selected or, or possibly even found at that point. It forced us then to start looking for factories and, and other things like that. To get underway with design and manufacturers many things have to be done but one of the key parts is to find a manufacturer or a factory in China that suits your needs in terms of uh, their ability to build at the scale that is uh, appropriate and also a uh, costing and to be able to source parts and have the right engineering resources uh, as part of their organisation. Very soon after the crowdfunding campaign closed I hopped on a plane flew to China after doing quite a bit of advanced research and flew around and looked at a number of different factories and met them and, and looked at their capabilities and the size of their business and how important what we might do would be to them ultimately we chose one and selected a factory in Shenzhen and we just immediately fell in love with them so I actually carefully chose a factory that had in-house plastic moulding, in-house PCB assembly, uh, in-house final assembly. They even do their own die casting. They mould the diffusers. They crimp the fittings on. They could essentially, as long as, as we were to provide the core technology and the designs, they were able to in-house manufacture the whole product. And that was critically important. This whole smart lighting thing was completely new to them. No one had ever done it before. They quickly saw the potential and said we really want to partner with you on on this and we want to learn with you how to make these products. More often than not you do rely very heavily on their ability to solve problems for you either around packaging or the uh, thermal thermal characteristics or the uh, power supplies particularly. You know, we needed a universal power supply that would work everywhere in the world different frequencies and, and voltages. Those are all challenging problems that uh, if you've got a good factory a partner it's really important. It's really easy to inadvertently select a factory that might say that they can and will do all those things in fact you may look at their finished product and believe they are doing all those things in-house but in fact what they're some really key parts of the manufacturer have been outsourced if you inadvertently choose a factory that is you know four key production items are essentially outsourced to other contracted factories you can find yourself running late uh, having quality control problems shipping delays and everything because there are you know, many other third-party parts to that puzzle after that, once the company was underway, I worked with John Bosch on new, new product development and the whole other team was, was, was built around actually 
taking the product to market. So prototyping the light in the beginning, the most difficult thing we had was thermally because the LEDs at that stage hadn't improved. The efficiency was still pretty bad when we began. So there was always a lot of heat. The product needed really big, heavy heat sinks. At that stage, the most viable chips for doing uh, Wi-Fi were still from proprietary companies, so uh, TI or, or Broadcom or Qualcomm. In that era when we began, uh, Wi-Fi radios were, most of them were rated for 70 degrees Celsius, if you were lucky. The Wi-Fi chip we chose in the first one, which was the Broadcom uh, chip, it uh, only had an 85 degrees Celsius temperature limit, so we were really hamstrung by that. We had a situation in the early ones where we had a master bulb which connected to Wi-Fi. It then relayed the signals uh, via the other network to the other bulbs, and, and we meshed them that way. But the message rate was so slow, it was, it was just unusable. We were adding Wi-Fi into something that had never had Wi-Fi in it before. Well, the first thing was we came up with how it looked and my son was the sort of creative uh, input to to all of that he he's very good artistically and knows what looks good so he was the, the instigator of the initial design of the light bulb the, the squarish kind of look it was hot uh, it had metal areas around it that would block the radio emissions and it needed to work in a home and we had to think of it being in lampshades and in roofs and and everywhere else so keeping that radio performance was like top priority. And we had to come up with creative ways to keep the uh, Wi-Fi module cool. We actually had to build the housing in a special way. We tried many different ways in fact uh, of how to place the antenna and where to put the wireless and processor board. We put it above the LEDs, in the middle of the LEDs, on the side. We looked at plastic housings. They were, didn't have enough heat sinking so we were back to the metal housing. And then there was actually a day, I literally remember it, sitting at the dining table at John Boschua's house where we decided to do a pie cut through the heat sink and make everything inside that pie cut plastic and somewhat thermally insulated from the, the hot heat sink, which is uh, running camera up to 105 degrees Celsius, obviously 20 degrees Celsius higher than the, than the radio system's allowed to be. And then we brought that board further out, encased it with plastic, thermally attached it to the plastic housing as well. Every trick that we could do to actually bring the temperature of that main board down and had to work out if we could fit what we wanted in to that shape. And when, when we got the looks matching the components to go in it, when that all married up, then we are in the right place. But it's really good to not only design for manufacturing, but understand what's going to happen with the certification. Certification is probably one of your biggest costs. For FCC, for electromagnetic compliance, there's radiated emissions, conducted emissions. Everything you often don't think of first, like shielding, sometimes comes back to relaying out your board to have shielding in the right places later. And we succeeded. We, we got our first product out. From where we started and from where I started and from where so much of the LifeX team started, everything we've done has been built on perseverance and optimism. Like those two words alone pretty much sum up how we have got to where we are. For us, we always chose the best. That was our, our we didn't necessarily choose what was suitable for the product. We chose the best in field on every component and we paid the price. Since we started, LEDs have got notably more efficient than they have before. When we began, we were probably 60 or 70 lumens per watt and that's with a really efficient power supply that we developed. Now we are around 100 lumens per watt with a more efficient power supply, but also with more efficient LEDs from the, the LED suppliers. The whole thing's been an incredible journey. I, I can't tell you, you know, I, I've gone from knowing virtually nothing about LEDs to being an expert on them now. So. The future is really bright for the light bulb and everything we're designing and imagining and building for the future, but the future is really bright for all these other experiences in the home, what we bring to them with light, with people sharing it with each other and enjoying it. The amazing team of people we have now, especially in the firmware area, I can't tell you how hard those guys work. It's a never-ending job. It just never, ever ends, firmware. I'd love to make sure our incredible team gets gets their credit, even my family that supports all of this work over so many years. The, the team that we've got here is, is just brilliant.